Greetings, colleagues. My name, as you stated, is Obet Masaraure. <coughs> For now, I am the spokesperson of Crisis in Zimbabwe Coalition, but also serving as the national president of the Amoga Method Road Teachers Union of Zimbabwe. It's pleasant to be here. Looking forward to a pleasant engagement. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kifto Stalo Siziba. I'm the national deputy spokesperson for the Citizens Coalition for Change, led by Advocate Nelson Chamisa. Thank you. Makadini Mose Lejani. Tara angu ndi nonzo linda tungira ima sarira mutonga miruwe bato relay by economists and African Democrats ndi no tenda. Thank you very much, uh, President Masarira. I think we want to make a correction from uh, the introduction by its honorable gift Ostalo Sisiwa. He says I am gift Ostalo Sisiwa. I think we, 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 we must get used to call you honorable. This idea that we can simply call you Ostalos, Ostalos, that I think is the Old Testament. The new political testament is that he is honorable, gift Ostalos, Caesar. That's the fix. So to, to start with, I think our meeting is in line with uh, the question of uh, addressing peaceful coexistence in our, in our country, the country which is the land between the Zambezi and the Limpopo River, called the Zimbabwe. On the 21st of September, Zimbabwe joined the rest of the, of the world in celebrating International Day for Peace under the theme Actions for Peace our ambition for the global goals. So what is our role as citizens? What is our role as Zimbabweans as we promote this uh, International Day for Peace? This is the context under which this uh, uh, meeting or dialogue meeting is taking place. But also it is taking place within the context of elections that took place in our country on the 23rd of uh, August, you know what happened in those elections. And you know that there are disputations around what happened in that election. And I do not want to, to preempt the nature of the disputations and the issues that we need to address. This is why we have called our colleagues here to deal with these issues. Is there a need for peace in Zimbabwe? And what kind of peace? Is there a forum that can facilitate that peace? And part of that process is this is themed gathering that is here to discuss those issues. So I'm not going to preempt what our esteemed uh, uh, panelists will say. Uh, but positive peace is anchored on the following eight pillars. Number one, a well functioning government, B, sound business environment, equitable distribution of resources, low levels of corruption, free flow of information, acceptance of the rights of others, good relations with our neighbors, high levels of human capital development. All these things that uh, our colleagues are talking about are found in the Declaration of Rights, Chapter 4 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe. The question of peace you are talking about is also enshrined, not only in the preamble of the Constitution, but in the Bill of Rights, um, which is a product of the 2013 Constitution, which was a result of dialogue. So, you Zimbabwe is doing a good thing. What they are doing is in line with the provisions of the Constitution. And in fact, the Constitution of the Republic of Zimbabwe, from the 1979 Constitution, what is popularly known as the longest house constitution, to the 2013 Constitution, they are all born out of dialogue. They are all born out of peace. But fundamentally, they are born out of struggles. From 1890 to 1980, 
we had several types of struggles, the struggles against colonialism, the independence struggle to 1980. But after 1980, we had other struggles, the struggle to build a nation state, to democratize the socio-economic question, de-racialize de the socio-economic institutions, but also addressing fundamental questions such as the land question. Democracy is not simply about civil and political rights, but it is also about issues of redistribution. And the issues of redistribution deals with issues of econ access to economic uh, uh, rights, access to water, socio-economic issues, and most fundamentally, the land question, which the 2013 Constitution, if you look at section, the preamble to the Constitution, section 71 and section 72, they all talk about the significance and importance of the land question. And the good thing about that is, whereas there used to be uh, contradictions on the question of land, literature and scholarly works, including political politicians, there is now a consensus that the land question in Zimbabwe is a question that is now beyond contradictions. There is a consensus among Zimbabweans that it is a settled issue. The issues that need to be addressed are how do we produce, how do we make sure that there is equitable distribution among Zimbabweans and so forth. I also want to acknowledge Ms. Mandinde. I think you can briefly introduce yourself. Oh, good evening. My apologies uh, for coming in late. My name is Ulbert Mandinde. I'm a legal practitioner. And currently I work for the Zimbabwe Human Rights and Joe Forum. I'm the acting director. Thank you. So let's uh, kick start the discussion. So we will proceed with our discussion as follows. I will pose a question and I will allow the panelists to, in less than two minutes, to make a, a response. We have five or so questions. Then we will allow uh, you colleagues to interact with these guys in very civil ways. We want to interact in civil ways so that when colleagues are asked to come to these forums, they don't fear that they will be booed. And so I'm not going to allow any kind of booing uh, to anyone. That is not the spirit of you, Zimbabwe, and that is not the spirit of dialogue. Once we start doing that, we are running in contradistinction to what we are here gathered to do. So. The first question is that uh, commemorating the International Day for Peace, just as the nation is coming out of the August 23, 23 general election, how best can you describe the state and prospects for peace in Zimbabwe? Given the circumstances where we are coming and within the broader context of the International Day for Peace, how do we uh, describe the current socio-political status quo post-August 2023? Any taker who wants to start this, uh, Ms. Masarori. Uh, thank you so much. I think we are coming from a situation where we have a thief who stole from people, and that thief is unapologetic. <laughs> and that thief is prepared to impose his will on the, on the victims of his thievery. And it's very unfortunate that this is the same person, constitutionally, who can go ahead and say we want to have dialogue, and do we have a dialogue holding a gun to say, come so that we discuss that the car I stole from you is permanently mine. So in this particular context, we have very violent peace where the victims themselves know the nature of the thief, that if we choose to speak out, against the thievery that occurred on the 23rd of August, we can be victims of brutality. So in that particular context, it would take a lot uh, to build the urgency of the victims to say, you have a right, you, have the, you are entitled to take back what it, is, what it is yours. But it also take a lot to engage the thief to say, this is not sustainable you can no, never at any point in time try to impose a will on the victims of your thievery. So we are in a context where we need the victims 
to speak out and the perpetrator to at least be told to step back and allow mutual engagement that can build sustainable peace. And it's very unfortunate that the perpetrator is unrelenting, the perpetrator is very arrogant, the victims themselves have been demobilized, they are so scared of the thief. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Ms. Masaraori, but I don't know about the, the thief you are talking about. It will be up to colleagues to, to interact with your view. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we submit that uh, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, by announcing a bogus result on the 23rd, set Zimbabwe into a path of uncertainty. That is the starting point. Zimbabwe has entered into a dark cloud of uncertainty, and two things define Zimbabwe at the present moment and is a direct threat to peace and sustainable peace for that matter. Number one is greed. Number two is a grievance. Those are essential ingredients and a pure direct threat to peace and stability in our country. We are being led by a parasitic elite that has so much greed for power, but that greed for power in itself is a threat to sustainable peace in our country. And that greed will mutate into a collective grievance for those who have studied countries that are unstable politically, particularly in the Middle East, and West Africa, right now we talk about a lot of uh, military interventions uh, recently, you know, in different West uh, countries. And, and, and what has happened there is because the interventions in the so-called democratic coups, which are a threat to peace and stability, are born out of a collective grievance by ordinary people, but not just by ordinary people, because that decreed by a few elites who make the grievance by ordinary people, which is in the case of Zimbabwe right now. When Zek announced the election, the grievance was collective. Every Zimbabwe felt like it was a funeral. So there's a grievance in the hearts and minds of ordinary people. But that grievance will not stop there. It will go to the pockets of teachers. It will go to the pockets of doctors. It will rear its ugly face in the pockets of junior soldiers. It will rear its ugly face in the pockets of uh, members of the secrocratic regime. And that will yield to a threat to stability and peace in our country. So by having an election which does not reflect the will of the people, as announced by the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission, jettison Zimbabwe direct into a cloud of uncertainty and direct threat uh, to peace in our country. Thank you. Can you come again with the question? Thank you, um, Prof. Rohanya. Um, first and foremost, I think it is important for us to go back into history that we have always been enjoying what is called artificial peace in Zimbabwe. And it is really scary because there is so much uncertainty. You don't know what will happen at any second. This has been so because of the toxicity and the polarity that has ex existed for more than 20 years in the political economy. As the opposition in this country was also trying to gain momentum, it joined the bandwagon along the way of polarization, toxicity, and violence. And it became a, a, a breeding ground for so much hate. 
between the two mainstream political parties then that was MDCT and ZANU-PF. Now when we look at the political context, we've got two very divergent views from the opposition and from the ruling party. And it is always the blame game. ZANU-PF is blaming Triple C, Triple C is blaming ZANU-PF. And when you stand in the middle, you are called, sell out, any other name, and you become a victim of ridicule. We have so many people who have decided to de-associate with both parties and have also become victims of the intolerance, toxicity, and polarity that is existing in this country. Why did I decide by going back to history? That is the reason why we are where we are today. I'll give an example of a marriage for those who are married. If you get home every day and your wife is nagging, insulting, screaming, etc., etc., you will never give that wife an ear. What we have failed to do in this country is to get to a stage where we say we have had enough toxicity, we have had enough polarity. Let's create a fertile ground for dialogue. Let's fix the problems that are bedeviling this country. Let's mend the broken social fabric because everyone who is hungrily searching for this power is self-seeking, whether from the opposition or from the ruling party. It is about me. How have I gotten to where I am? Because clearly, if it was about the people of Zimbabwe, I am sure every political party leader in this country would have taken time to say, let's sit down and start talking about the problems that are affecting Zimbabwe. As it stands right now, everyone is fighting for their little corner which is creating a lot of agitation in the people of this country. And the people of this country, in their ignorance or knowledge or lack of both, I don't know, have been blindly following the toxicity and the polarity which has destroyed us as a nation. So what we are, the stage we are in right now, we are in a stage of artificial peace and people need to find each other before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you very much. With the artificial peace in the state, fundamentally because our politicians are self-interested. They save the parochial interest of uh, their political organizations and their leadership. And the question of citizens, where citizens come in, is a huge issue according to President Masarela. So on 21 September, which was the International Day of Peace, the Zimbabwe Human Rights and Your Forum uh, released a report which uh, we entitled A Peace That Is No Peace. And that statement we acknowledged uh, the fact that there were elections which were held, uh, that uh, some of the observers thought that the elections were peaceful, uh, but that what we witnessed ourselves is no peace. Uh, on the same day, our member organization, the Zimbabwe uh, Human Rights Association, Zim Rights, uh, released a state of peace report uh, in which uh, it uh, uh, deemed it a perpetual state of insecurity in Zimbabwe. A perpetual state of insecurity in Zimbabwe. Basically, when you look at both titles, that is a peace that is no peace, and a perpetual state of insecurity in Zimbabwe, it basically reflects the fact that there is no peace uh, which is uh, there. In the aftermath of the elections, our concern, especially us who are in human rights, us who are human rights defenders, us who are lawyers who are practicing within the scope, get worried about the nature and arrests of some of the people that are being arrested. But more worrying for us is a situation where you actually find that lawyers are now being arrested. We believe lawyers are the last line of defense. Anyone who is in trouble will say, get my lawyer. But when you get, we get your lawyer, and your lawyer goes to rescue you, and your lawyer gets arrested, 
is something really which is worried. Where do you tend to when your lawyer is arrested? And therefore, we cannot pretend that we cannot see these things. We are aware of the arrest two weeks or so ago of Doug Court at, at Tapiwa Mchineripi. We are aware in January of the assault of Kuzai Kazere, whom I had to go and rescue after he was arrested whilst trying uh, to represent the Budiriro 25 who were, who had then been arrested. And therefore, any attack on the legal profession is an attack on us all because it is lawyers who come to your protection when you are actually victimized, when you are victims of human rights abuses. But we are even more worried about the arrest of recently elected members of parliament. We are not saying people who have committed offenses should not be arrested, but we have seen more and more what we call victimization of those that are deemed to be within the opposition and mainly within the mainstream opposition. These are some of the things which are wor worrying. We have seen cases uh, of, uh, we have received and verified cases of abductions. We have received and verified and assisted people who have been assaulted. Certainly post-election, these are things which we do not need as a country. And therefore, as we commemorate International Day of Peace, we say the peace is not there at the moment. Th thank you very much. Basically, his last point is talking about the fact that uh, a lawyer should not be identified with the cause or should not be associated with the cause of his clients. That uh, lawyers must be independent to carry their duties. It's one fundamental cornerstone of a constitutional democracy. It's a critical issue when you talk about the independence of the judiciary. You cannot have an independent judiciary when you do not have independent lawyers. So lawyers must be able to do their work without uh, undue uh, influence from the state. So lawyers must not be associated with the cause of their clients. I think you know in the past we had lawyers who are in the opposition who were representing people in, uh, in Zanpi. You have lawyers, for instance, during the end of Mugabe, who represented the uh, uh, war veterans, the likes of Douglas Mahia, who is, the second, is, is in the San Pedro Politburo, was represented, as I remember, by the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights, but he's from Zan. The, lawyers for, the Zimbabwe Lawyers for Human Rights did not say because you are from this political party, they just represent anyone. So lawyers must not be associated with the cause of their clients, therefore the independence of Lawyers is important in a constitutional democracy. Um, having said that, we go to question number two. This time around, I'm, I'm not going to be very liberal. I, I, I want you to, to address the question in a minute. And the second question from what I read is that we have state institutions like the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission. We have state institutions like the police, the army, if you look at section 10 of the constitution. These institutions are supposed to guarantee the security of citizens, uh, guarantee law and order, peace and tranquility in the country. The question that arises is that have these institutions fulfilled their constitutional mandate? If they have done that, how have they done that? If they have not, what in your view are the challenges that these institutions that are responsible for the security of citizens for the security of the state, what have been their challenges? And in your view, what should be done to address the inadequacies, or if there are no inadequacies, what is it that we can celebrate about the role of these institutions? Uh, we can start the other direction this time. Uh, so my starting point, basically, is when we have complaints against those that are supposed to protect us. We have a constitution which has actually provided for that. And section 210 of the constitution provides for the creation of an independent uh, complaints commission, which is supposed to uh, investigate the excesses uh, of the state. And thanks to organizations such as the Zimbabwe Trust, the government was forced to come up with a law uh, to create uh, this commission. It had actually, I think the government was given 45 days 
uh, after Mr. Mahi and others had actually taken it to court to come up with that. We saw the Zimbabwe Independence Complaints Commission Act passing through Parliament and being signed into law uh, by the President, I think, last year. But we have not seen the appointment of anyone in that commission to operationalize it. There is apparent lack of willpower to ensure that there are investigations uh, are, which are independent, which can take place. You are assaulted by the police, you are expected to go and report to the police. Surely do you expect the police to investigate themselves? At the moment at the Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum, we are currently seized with a matter in Guruwe, where there is someone who was killed by the police, shot by the police in cold blood, and left in a mortuary, and nothing is said about this particular person. Where do you report such a thing? That those are some of the issues. The moderator started by uh, saying independent commissions and raised the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission, NPRC. And we all know that the NPRC's mandate came to an end, abrupt end, 10 years lapsed in terms of the constitution. It had been given 10 years and nothing happened within uh, the 10 years. Yes, there were challenges about the period, but still the judiciary said, okay, it's coming to an end. It's a commission which was there. It's a commission which we saw no use. It's a commission which did not really bring us together. A commission which did not do anything insofar as peace was concerned. We have a partisan police force, and we have always said it, and we have always called for the police to behave in a professional manner. They are police for everyone. They are not police for a particular political party. But so many times we are seeing people being arrested. We represent so many politicians who are taken to the law and order. And when you consider the particular crime that they would have committed, is that they are not in the ruling party. They are in the opposition political party. The issue is about state institutions. They are meant to behave like institutions of all Zimbabweans and institutions of not of a particular political party. And the recommendation that I will give is that, number one, there be the willpower by those who are in power to ensure that for once as Zimbabweans, uh, we, we live by the rule of law and not rule by law. The laws should be followed so that they protect each and every person who is there. But number two, that everyone who works for the state should realize that they work for the state, work for the state, work for the people, and therefore should not really associate with a political party. Thank you very much. Uh, basically what he's saying is that uh, law is not just law, but a reflection of the stance of the most powerful group in society. If you are a Marxist, that is Marx's view, that law is not law, but a reflection of the stance of the most powerful group in society. And uh, if you follow Makamure, the late, you would say that uh, both the state and law are not independent categories. The state and law are there to save the ruling elite at a particular historic moment. May Makamure rest in peace. I will, I will proceed to the next day. Thank you. The Chapter 12 institutions in Zimbabwe have been a huge disappointment. The Zimbabwe Human Rights Commission has got nothing to show to the state. And my question would also go back to the civic society in this country. Have we held the Chapter 12 institutions to account? We haven't. Have we tried to put them in one room and demand accountability? Because they should actually report back to the people of Zimbabwe on what they have achieved. Unfortunately, we have become crybabies on social media spaces, on debates. But when it comes to holding the actual commissioners to account, we fall short. Like uh, my colleague here just uh, alluded to, NPRC also has nothing to show after 10 years. We thought that they would deal with the underlying issues to do with reuniting Zimbabwe. Peace, reconciliation. There's a lot that has happened in this country. Long sleeve, short sleeve, gukura, wundi, all that. And there are a lot of wounds that are still burning within the people of Zimbabwe. We have also had the Zimbabwe Gender Commission, which some of us, like me, uh, who believe in gender balance and equality, 
thought that they would make effort to ensure oper operationalization of Section 17 of the Constitution of Zimbabwe and protection of all genders in political activities in this country. But that, that has not happened as well. So going forward, we realize that the Constitution of Zimbabwe is not yet considered supreme law of this land. Yet section two expressly states that any custom, any practice that is against the constitution is invalid. What has been our role in demanding accountability, in demanding transparency for these commissions to actually fulfill their mandate as enshrined in the constitution of Zimbabwe? What we see is selective application of the constitution. Everyone in the opposition, in the ruling party, the people of Zimbabwe, we just watch these people, yet they have got guidelines and mandates that they are supposed to fulfill, which we have never held them to account. My parting shot is we need to hold them to account. Civic society, please create a platform to bring them into an area, a space where we can demand accountability on whether or not they fulfilled their mandate as enshrined in the Constitution of Zimbabwe. Thank you, uh, Madam President. She's, she was talking about uh, issues of transitional justice. That uh, there has not been transitional justice in this country. And transitional justice happens in two forms. There's what is called the restorative transitional justice and retri uh, retributive transitional justice, or where we, we find trials, or uh, the re restorative where we find like truth commissions, like what happened in South Africa. She's fundamentally saying that uh, there has not been transitional justice in that political parties, not only the ruling party, but including the opposition in Zimbabwe have not fostered to address issues of transitional justice in Zimbabwe. Uh, thank you very much. I think that um, we submit that the problem with chapter 12 institution is in the following respect. Number one is the state military party conflation. In Zimbabwe, it is difficult to separate state institutions from ZANU-PF. I was arrested, in fact, I was abducted at some, some time back in 2016. And then I was taken to ZANU-PF headquarters and I was tortured there. And then as a revolutionary Marxist, you understand that uh, you must fight the struggle to its logical conclusion. So I was never petrified. But when it was time for me to get justice, I was taken to the police. The police didn't protect me. They further beat me up and I was thrown into Chikrubi Maximum Prison. When I went to court, so you are moving from, one to, from a political party torture chamber, you are going into a state institution, which is the police, which is supposed to protect you and arrest the perpetrator. But it further perpetuated the violation. And then you seek again justice from the judiciary. Before the magistrate reads a judgment for our bail condition after staying more than 30 days, the same person who was torturing you comes to court and briefs the magistrate. And the magistrate issues a clear political judgment that bail is denied. So... These institutions, according to the law, must be separate. What is called separation of powers. Judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. But in Zimbabwe, it's one thing. And you can't seek redress because of capture. So you are almost like in this one big Zanpev house of terror. You are just being moved from one room to another. So to expect that you can move from a police cell to a judicial courtroom to get justice is a difficult thing to fathom and imagine in our jurisdiction. So that is the first problem. The conflation of state institutions and the political part. Number two is the question of executive tyranny. The biggest crisis in this country is an executive that has become the law unto itself. And that is shown by every decision that is being made in this country, which affects the entire political economy of our nation. If you look at the cabinet appointments, 
it shows an executive uh, that is the law unto itself. If you look at the conduct of judges, if you look at the conduct of uh, ministers in parliament, they are borrowing on behalf of their generation, on behalf of our generation, and on behalf of the unborn. The domestic debt in this country is ballooning. I'm telling you who borrow money without parliamentary oversight, despite the constitution being clear that for this amount of money, it only has to be approved through parliament. But the executive will just proceed. So I'm talking about executive tyrann. So in the constitution, there is a separation between the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, and state institution. But in reality, it is not. A decision made by the executive, that's why you saw uh, 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 them breaking that uh, and this pressure, I do what I want. I am the head of the executive, so I'll do whatever I want. I'm not accountable to anyone. That is the biggest uh, and second most important problem. Number three is a culture of impunity. So chapter 12 institutions cannot hold anyone, particularly executive politicians, to account because of impunity. If you look at, uh, there's a, a minister, an MP in Marshallland East, that threatened one of the presidential candidates, our presidential candidate, and the winning pres president in this country, Advocate Nelson Chamis. He made clear threats that Chamisa must be killed. You are threatening an incoming head of state. Nothing happens to you. There is this one, Barbara Rhodes. He calls a police officer. She calls a police officer, threatens a police officer. Instead of Barbara running away, it is the police officer who runs away. Despite that, the officer is clear in terms of what the law says. You move from there, there is this other thief, uh, the fake prophet. They steal from the poor. There is a documentary exposing them. Taking out money, illicit, in that fashion, removing gold, exploiting investors and so forth. Prophet. Uh, and then, that person who is supposed to be arrested by Zak, a chapter 12 institution, is actually rewarded. You see him with the head of state in the United Nations. So what happens when you steal, they say to you, no, you have, you have been caught in the ministry of lands. Now we move you so that you go and steal in the ministry of health. So impunity, rewarding of thievery and rewarding of people who are breaching the law is the reason why chapter 12 institutions cannot be effective because there are people who are immune and there are people who are not punishable by the law in this country. Thank you. Just uh, an intervention before we allow Comrade Masara uh, to, to speak. Law is law, whether good or bad. Is that not so, Mr. Mandini? So, going by that definition, whether we like it or not, whether political, political parties, the ACT, like it or not, the head of state and president is the, Mr. Emerson Davidson-Nangagwa in terms of the law. Is that not so? Law is law, whether good or bad. That is what we call a positivist approach to law. Yeah, this is what, yeah, yes. That is what the law says. And it says, no, no, this is not a rally. This is not a rally. I like that. Hey, comrades, let me finish. L let me finish. Yes, that is what the law says. Law is law, whether good or bad. And the law is a command issued by the sovereign, which citizens generally are obedient to. That is what the law is. Yes, you are entitled to your other view, but we are talking about the positivist approach to law. Ms. Mandinde, is that not the correct position? From a positivist approach. So, but what Ostalos was talking about is what we call conflation of the state and party. The party-state conflation is a major issue. And according to Kagoro, Kagoro talks about rule by substitution, where the president is the party, 
the party is the government, the government is the state, and everything is conflated. But I would add what Jawusile Shumba, in his thesis, 2011, he says that in Zimbabwe we have a problem of what he calls party state business military complex. And those things are conflated to the extent that you don't know who is who. Having said that, I will proceed to president. We used to call him president, but now he's the spokesperson of crisis. Uh, thank you so much, Mkoma Rwanya. Uh, but I will begin with reminding colleagues here to revisit the statements of one Edison Zobo when he was saying, when we liberate this country, we don't want our people to barricade their homes during the night because they are afraid of their own state. Comrades, are you sure that you are not barricading your homes? If you are, I'm going to ask this question to Wombe, Wombe Rai Nende today, could it, you sleep at home peacefully, knowing that my state can take care of me? If you are going to ask me the question, my answer will be the negative. Because for two times, the state is led by Emerson Mnangagwa, broke into my home, tortured me, at some point left me for dead. So these are the state institutions as inherited from the colonial settlement, from the colonial regime of Ian Smith. We still have the UDI problem today. We would have expected that now we are pushing uh, for a liberated Zimbabwe. We are going to see some transformation in how our state institutions are run. But in as much they were preserving the rule of Ian Douglas Smith before independence, they are doing the same today, bidding for the ruling ZANPF party. Now, we have a crisis when we start to be troubled, accuse each other of not doing enough to lobby. You can't lobby these people. What is needed in Zimbabwe is a revolution. Uh, when we can then transform, because the 1980 revolution was aborted, because it was supposed then to transform these state institutions from saving white minority room to save the majority of the people of Zimbabwe. But then the ZANPF managed then to make sure uh, that uh, that transition was never going to be a reality. And it's very unfortunate that today you can speak of Matanda Moyo to say she can deal with corruption. You can speak of uh, whoever you want to speak about, to say they can be able to bring reconciliation in Zimbabwe. But yet we know that these people were appointed to frustrate the whole process that was exposed in the constitution. Because ZANPF was forced into a constitutional settlement during the GNU. They never wanted the constitution. And whatever they are doing today is to frustrate the implementation of the same constitution. So what is needed at the moment uh, is to say, how do we transform these institutions which are under a strong grip of ZANPF? Are we going to ask kindly to ZANPF to say, comrades, this is maybe time to talk, we can have a good discussion with them and allow them to let go, or it's time really to go for a revolution and push them out and then reform the institutions? So we have to pick and have one choice. We have a clear path of reforming these state institutions. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have. And Itai Zamara today will tell you that the state, as it is today, the state institutions are not reliable, are not for the people, but are for those who are ruling today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Like I said, we used to call him President. You remind me of uh, the book written by Edison Jonas Mudadir Wajobko. Edison Jonas Mudadir was a ZANPF politician and an academic a lawyer. He wrote a book in 1976, published in Sydney, Australia, called The Law as an Instrument of Oppression in Southern Rhodesia. And on page 30 of that book, Jobgo says this, in Southern Rhodesia, a prison is a place where big criminals keep smaller ones. That was Jobway 1976, book published in Australia, Sydney, called The Law as an Instrument of Oppression in Southern Rhodesia. And on page 30, he says, In Southern Rhodesia, a prison is a place where big criminals keep smaller ones. I don't know what the state of affairs uh, since 1976, when he wrote that book, what is the status quo today? It's up to you, uh, as colleagues, to discuss whether we have that kind of status quo. Now, the 
third question we are dealing with is that in the past, following the 2008 uh, elections, in which for the first time the opposition won parliament and they had the first speaker of parliament in the history of Zimbabwe since 1980, who was called Love Momoyo. Uh, the first election in March was won by the late Morgan Changrai. And then we went for the June 2008 election, which was rejected by the African Union, which led to the negotiations led by former South African President Mbeki, leading to the GNU. So there was a GNU, which was a result of a disputed election. So in the current context, there are different views by different people. Some who are saying, we need dialogue. So the question is, what kind of dialogue do we need? I want to pose to the panelists. Do we support, do you guys, as political parties and civil society uh, organizations, do you support national dialogue at this juncture? If yes, what should be the, the key focus areas? Who should convene it? Who should be part of that process? What should be the end goal of that process, if it were to take place? Let me start from here. This time around, I, I give you 60 seconds only. <laughs> so thank, thank you so much. I, I've, been good, I've been good with the time. Uh, so I think to begin with, um, when we say we want dialogue, it's, uh, this is what we all want. And the objectives have to be said clearly. Uh, in Sudan, they set the objectives, like they turned points to say we need national dialogue, and they set the, they had the points clearly. But there was motivation for dialogue, there was an incentive for dialogue. We all want dialogue, but that kind of dialogue is not going to be the 1987 dialogue, it's not going to be the 2008 kind of dialogue. It is going to be dialogue which is more inclusive, which is not for political players who are thinking that maybe. I thought. Proceed, comrade. Uh, but you were obstructing the process. <laughs> okay. So what are, what we are simply demanding is that if there, there is going to be dialogue, it should be inclusive dialogue. And the, the, the genesis of dialogue is through con con consultation so that it has legitimacy. You can't sit in one room because you, you store elections from each other. Maybe Mnangagwa store an election from Chamisa. We don't expect Chamisa and Emerson Mnangagwa to sit in one room and say, comrades, we have now agreed that this is now the roadmap for Zimbabwe. We have seen from the past that this has failed consistently because people, when they get in those rooms, they have a tendency of forgetting those who were rallying behind them. So we want a dialogue which is very legitimate from the grassroots to say everyone would feel that we are included. But what are the objectives for dialogue in Zimbabwe? The key objectives for me speaking at the moment is to say the pocket of the ordinary person who can't even buy milli meal tonight what is the immediate solution? Because we don't want dialogue that will prolong the suffering of our people. The second issue is to say, how do we ensure that the next time we hold an election, it is not going to be disputed? We have held disputed elections for a very long time. This is the kind of dialogue that we want, and we have a better footing because we have a constitution that we are also going to be dialoguing on, on point number three. To say at least it's not a perfect document, but let's ensure that it is a document that we all respect and go ahead with as a, as a, as a dialoguing point. As a fourth dialoguing point, we are looking at to say, we have people who were killed in 2008 when people were killed during uh, Gukura Wundi. Uh, how do we restore? How do we ensure that those people uh, are no longer grieved? How do we ensure that uh, we, 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 we compensate uh, the victims and there's truth telling and the state of, of which was the perpetrator can also apologize. So when we are talking of dialogue, it is not going to be initiated by this head of state but this head of state we know from his history that is not a sincere man. We know from his history that is very selfish. We need a dialogue that can at the least be mediated by externals, maybe AU and SADAC, but the kind of polar like dialogue is not acceptable at the end of the day. It will not take us anyway. We are still where we were. Uh, thank you very much. Our position as C is very clear. It is informed by our historical and ideological understanding 
that every revolution, every war, whether violent or non-violent, end on the negotiation table. Whatever route we will take to resolve the political crisis in this country, at the end of the day, we all have to sit down and agree on the path that Zimbabwe must take. Now, for us, the reason why there must be a political settlement in Zimbabwe is because since 1980, Zimbabwe has been gripped by vicious cycles of disputed elections. Elections have left Zimbabwe in society divided than united. Why? Because they are not being conducted in a manner prescribed for by the law of the country. So dialogue has to be a process that takes Zimbabwe back to the road to legitimacy. How do we exit from that crisis? We must dialogue and converse to agree on a roadmap to go back into a fresh election. Because this current class of 2023 has no mandate of the people, has no mandate of the ordinary people. That's why, Prof, you saw people, that's why you saw them, uh, Comrade Linda, the people attending here, being a sample of the Zimbabwean ordinary population, rejecting the assumption that the current occupant of number one Chancellor Avenue has the legitimate will of the people. Why? Those who govern, to clarify and help my sister is a student of modern scientific thought. <laughs> you can be in government because you have got the will of the state, not of the people, but in a democracy. So those with the mandate of the people have no means, and those with the means have no mandate from the people. That's why Zimbabwe suffers from what philosophers call a broken down social contract. There is no relationship between those who govern and those that are being governed. That's why when they announced the gentleman which is occupying state house right now, Zimbabweans were almost mourning because they know that what was announced by Zek is not the reflection of what they put on the ballot. So dialogue, dialogue must be a dialogue to go back into a road of producing a leader that is born out of the will of the people. That is what dialogue must be all about. We must go back into the road of a credible election that will produce a credible leadership so that next time when we go to UN, we don't address chess, but we address other heads of chess. Thank you. I wanted to respond to you, Comrade Dostalos, but I will not at this juncture. <laughs> because Tingato Tanga I will respond to Comrade Ruang. I think um, one of the biggest problems we've had in Zimbabwe is thinking that the redemption that we need is going to come from elections. Because it is not going to come from elections. The GNU was actually a clearer picture of the political leaders we have in this country. When the opposition went into the GNU, they had an opportunity to fix a lot of things, but they didn't. They also joined the bandwagon of primitive accumulation of wealth. They forgot about electoral reforms. They forgot about labor justice. They forgot about the things that they had promised the people of Zimbabwe. I always say this, that our biggest crisis in this country is the governance system that we adopted from the Smith regime, that is repressive, oppressive, and suppressive. I'll give an example. During the GNU era, when I was employed at the National Railways of Zimbabwe, we had a labor action, we had a strike. We were arrested, taken to court, took our issue to labor court, and the labor minister was from the MDC then. We had a real case before the courts of law. We had gone for 11 months with no salary, but the labor minister gave us a show cause order. I speak about the issue of the governance system because it is an issue that our politicians do not want to talk about. Because everyone wants that governance system in place so that they get in, they also use it to suppress the then opposition. I'll give an example. Just this week, Edgar Lungu was stopped from jogging in Zambia by a former opposition who is now the ruling party. Everyone gets in, uses the same oppressive, repressive system to oppress those who are oppressing or repressing them back then. If we are sincere that we want change, genuine change in this country, the conversation henceforth should start on 
how we can transition from the governance system you are using, we adopted from the Smith regime, to a governance system that is inclusive, that benefits all the people of Zimbabwe, and not just those in politics or those in power. So what we need is a broad-based, inclusive, and participatory dialogue that includes labor, student unions, civic society, the church, politicians, etc., etc. For me, this thing of saying dialogue should happen between politicians is a recipe for disaster. Because almost all politicians are self-serving. That is the reality. They will tell you what they want to hear, but will never give you what you want. So at the end of the day, that dialogue that we want should end all forms of violence. Redefine and re-establish strong nation-building programs. Strengthen the social, the, the social contract between the people of Zimbabwe and the state. Settle historical disputes and all sources of conflicts. What we need at the end of the day is inclusive national development and economic recovery. A dialogue that will not include Matumbu Elan and wealth creation and job creation are useless. We have been, people have been conditioned to just think of the president in courts and we forget about self. So this dialogue that we are talking about should include even the informal sector. Monwese should be part of this dialogue for us to save Zimbabwe. Thank you. Uh, she, I almost said I have no comment. I want to agree with President Lind. My point basically is I had written here that inclusive dialogue it has to be inclusive dialogue for sustainable democracy and peace. I was going to speak to the issue that when we are going to have any sort of form of dialogue, then it's the table for everyone. And I think uh, President Linda also came up with a comprehensive list in which she excluded uh, women, youth, religious leaders, civil society, among others. But the issue at the end of the day is I want to agree also even with our uh, uh, spokesperson. Uh, who mentions uh, the issue that we can no longer trust political parties to go on the table and uh, converse on their own. Uh, it's, um, there is no dialogue without us. The issue is whenever we are, the, there is going to be dialogue, the dialogue is about us, and it is going to be about us, but also it is going to be with us. One of the mistakes which happened after the inclusive process uh, of 2013 uh, which led to the current 2013 constitution was the fact that immediately thereafter, uh, um, I'd hoped to see one Jelas Mawarire here so that you would continue to answer for his sins. But one of his many sins is that he went to the uh, court then, constitutional court, uh, sued the, uh, the president then to compel the holding of an election after the constitution, and yet we had not put in place any transitional mechanisms to ensure that all the functions, all the commissions, all the things which we desired the constitution to be able to do for us as Zimbabweans would be done. Belatedly, we saw religious leaders then come, trying to come up, I think, in the last three, four years, we had to declare a Sabbath or a moratorium on elections. But the issue is, I think we needed those in, in, in 2013. We, at that particular time, I think, even the power matrix was such that we did not have an absolute leader. There was always going to be some negotiations which was taking place. Yes, other political parties were crying foul because they also wanted to be on the table. And yet, at the, that particular time, we believe the situation then was a little bit better because it was conducive for us to have continued in a trajectory in which we would then have operationalized our constitution and ensured that by the time we possibly would have arrived to this particular area, things would have been balanced everywhere. Not the situation we currently find ourselves in, where I think the judgment in Jelas Mawarire took us back to almost a one-party state. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I will give uh, each of you 30 seconds to address the, the last uh, questions. I will make it a hybrid question. And this is to do with what would be the role of uh, um, regional and international bodies, if any, in any form of uh, dialogue or uh, conversations around the Zimbabwe question. We are talking about the AU, 
We are talking about SADIC. That's one thing. And the second uh, question is, what will be the role of a, an ordinary person in Gandanzara, in Cholocho, in Gwanda? What is the role of those who cannot come to these public spaces, who may not be able to be on the negotiating table? Like Linda was talking, Linda raised a very important question on the is that uh, any kind of dialogue should not be elite-based. And she talked about the critical sectors of the economy that has to be represented in such kind of conversations. She talked about the informal sector and fundamentally the role of uh, women. If you are, you, are, you are doing any form of discussion in any form of conversations that do not address the gender question, it is political tomfoolery. You are not addressing anything. So on that point, the Comrade President, you raised a fundamental issue on the question of the gender question and the informal question, the informal sector. This is where the economy, if 90% of Zimbabweans are not employed, the question is where is this 90%? Where are their voices? How do you bring them aboard, these people who are not employed? So I'll give you 30 seconds each to address the role of international community and the role of ordinary people in any form of conversation before we allow colleagues to interact with you. I will start with you. In the first 15 seconds, I will mention the role of the uh, international community as well as the regional community. The, their role is basically to bring together us as Zimbabweans. Their role is to recognize what has to be recognized and ensure that delegitimize that which has to be delegitimized. You cannot have a situation in which people can treat the situation in Zimbabwe as business as usual. This is business unusual. And we want the international community to come to that particular realization that things in Zim are not usual, that things in Zim need to be regularized, and that they have a role to bring us together. But in the last 15 seconds, I speak about the grandmothers, our brothers, sisters, cousins, nephews, and friends in the rural areas far away from Harare. And I say we need the processes to be inclusive. We need to include them. I think one of the best examples I can give is what we saw the COPAC process do. I observed the COPAC process myself. I think I traveled far and wide, deep into the rural areas, where I saw processes are being undertaken. Yes, there are arguments that they might have been manipulated at the end of the day, but the voices were heard. We heard them say, yes, we heard them being taught from time to time, being trained on what to say, but they also had an opportunity to be able to speak, and we would want this process to include them too, not to decide for them. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Manjinde. Thank you. Uh, for me, all these international bodies are toothless bulldogs. And I think if we're going to get to a stage where we are going to fix the problems bedeviling Zimbabwe, we have to do it our own way. We have to define what it is that we need going forward. We need to make sure that we go the organic route, having everyone involved. There are a lot of people that have been excluded in processes in this country. We've got people in traditional leadership that are always marginalized or sidelined. I've asked this question in various spaces, where are the sabukus? Where are the headsmen? They are not involved in these conversations. And yet we also forget that almost 70% of the electorate resides in rural areas. But when we have these debates, they are mainly for the urbanites. And they do not have the exposure that we also have. So when we talk about trying to engage SADAC, SADAC has always been um, on the side of the ruling party, from my perspective. We have had multilateral institutions across the world that have always been serving their interests and what they want to get out of Zimbabwe, and not what is beneficial to the people of Zimbabwe. And if we want to get to a stage where we are going to get things that benefit us, as native Zimbabweans, we have to define that trajectory. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. We have a fundamental difference in the point of departure on in understanding of diplomacy and the role of SADAC. Uh, no country can exist in isolation. We are member states of SADAC. 
we are member states of the African Union. It was created to make sure that we coexist because no country can exist in isolation. SATAC has taken a very firm and a clear position on the side of the people that the election in Zimbabwe was flawed and that the election did meet the SATAC guidelines on democratic elections. And that's an important starting point on the role of the international community to help Zimbabweans find each other because there is a dark cloud of uncertainty in this country. There's a sharp division and contradictions among the major political organizations. And therefore, there must be a conversation, but that conversation must be scaffolded by SATAC because it is part of its duty, it is part of its mandate to help its member state resolve conflicts. That is the role of SATAC, that is the role of the African Union. And that's why in wars on countries you see SADAC sending troops, because that is the mandate of uh, uh, you know, SADAC, the African Union, and any union that a country would have signed to a treaty to be. So it is important, the international community plays an important role in making sure that they help Zimbabweans, but of course we have our own domestic moral and political responsibilities uh, as Zimbabweans so that we resolve uh, the crisis we are facing. Ordinary people for us are very important, and to have said this for avoidance of doubt, we have said as Triple C, a dialogue that must happen is an all-inclusive process. All-inclusive means it must not just be a process of political elites, it must be a process that includes uh, members uh, of society through their representative capacities, residents, vendors, trade unions, students, bankers, the middle class, professionals, and everyone, so that we are able to produce a legitimate outcome. So we are very clear as an alternative that the dialogue must be about Zimbabwe so that whatever comes out of that process is collective and is agreeable by Zimbabweans and ordinary people who will be represented by different platforms where they belong. And the church is an important uh, player in that particular you know, role. Not uh, obviously these men of the clergy that have been spewing draws about uh, political parties accepting an illegitimate outcome. That's not what we expect. The clergy and the church must be able to play an important role as a moral and neutral arbiter, not taking the side of any of the afflicted parties. Thank you. The same way we expected Marshall, Samora Marshall, to risk the economy of Mozambique, housing our people to fight for the liberation of this republic, Kaunda to house our liberation fighters in Zambia. It is the same way we still trust SADAC today to say when we have a crisis in Zimbabwe, it is our own region that can help to resolve the Zimbabwean crisis. It will be very unfortunate to then try to approach a divided international community. We, are, we know it's seized in contradictions and conflicts at the moment without solid support in the region. So it would be very unfortunate if Zimbabweans would choose to disregard their own SADAC and choose to try to wag their tail maybe towards the west or the east, disregarding home because Zimbabwe is a small republic that can easily be torn apart if it gets engulfed in the international conflict. So we trust the region to play the same role it did way then when they assisted us to wage a liberty struggle. They can still assist us in our transition to a democratic dispensation. And when we come back at home, it is mandatory that the Nothing should be done for the people without the input of those same ordinary people. It is the people who desperately need a solution to the crisis. And we should expect the mothers in Uzumba, Maramba, Fungwe, the mothers in Dodito to be heard when we dialogue on the way forward of this republic. No one owns this country. You can own your money, but not a whole country. These are individual people with sovereign rights to speak for themselves whenever decisions are made. No one can make decisions for them. Thank you very much, uh, our esteemed uh, panelists. I think we had uh, a, a very civil uh, conversation so far, which is what we, we expect uh, from such kind of uh, dialogues. Now, it is time for you colleagues to fire questions to our colleagues. We are not expecting people to make presentations. Just a short question to these comrades, so that uh, uh, they appreciate the other view. So I will start with you, my friend.
All right. Uh, my question goes to President Linda. I think President Linda has been very specific when it comes to the issue of everyone participating in a dialogue. But then my question now, uh, coming to you, President Linda, I think it's not just about trying to have everyone participating in a dialogue, because you don't want to end up having 40 people in the same dialogue. Like, for example, if that door was to be closed, and we'd all agree on which is a better team, Manchester City or Arsenal, that would go on the whole day and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. So if we're ever going to go into a dialogue, we need people that matter. The challenge that, the challenge that was there with the dialogue that we had in 2014 was there was only one challenge when it came to that JNU. You had people that were representing no one sitting on a table negotiating on behalf of no one. It's like the same thing as saying that Pollard is discussing on behalf of people. If you only remove one person, according to Zeg, anyone knows who was involved in the last Pollard did not even reach a two percentage, all those people combined. And how can such people be there? <laughs> and how can such people be there trying to represent? Who are they representing? I think that then becomes my question to you. Who do you think really matters to be there in a dialogue? Because someone must not just participate in a dialogue for the sake of being a dialogue. You mentioned uh, the informal sector. Do you think Stenis Orwadza de de deserves to be in a dialogue, in a national dialogue? For what? Thank you very much. Next time, I, I want a short one, but you asked a very brilliant question. But only to correct you, let's address the president of Lid as President Linda Masarira, not President Linda, President Masarira. That, yeah, we, we, we need to do that and respect each other. You can, if I was president, would you say President Pates? You would say President Ryan. Let's do that. Let, let's, not, uh, uh, let's respect each other. Uh, next question. Next question. Uh, thank you very much. My question goes to lead, pre lead President Linda Masarira. You have talked about the issue of, of toxicity uh, that's affecting our nation. My question is, uh, I've seen you on Twitter, you have downplayed a lot of abductions, saying there's a well-coordinated and systematic abductions in Zimbabwe. And sometime back in 2018, you talked about people being trained outside, outside the country. Do you have like, any evidence to beg, to beg that? Isn't that part of toxicity? Thank you. Third question. Is there a lady? Before I look into this uh, man, is there a lady with a question? A lady with a question? We want inclusive. Are you a lady? <laughs> okay, I'll allow you to. I'll allow you. Just a joke. All right, All right thank you. Uh, my question again, I think, is directed to President Masarira. <laughs> so. Um, we are talking about inclusivity and everything. Uh, first, uh, I think you were part of the, the Pollard group and all. Oh, I would want to know, uh, in brief, just some achievements, if any, that were drawn from Pollard. Because what we saw was uh, uh, we saw them spending taxpayers' money and, and, and everything and everything. So I would want to have uh, just, just a brief of any achievements, if any, if there are any. So that we get an understanding of why we are involving certain people who, according to him and the sentiments that I do echo, they practically represent next to no one, except maybe their friends or families and group of their workers. So I want to know that. Thank you very much. Because the, 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 the three questions are directed at uh, President Masarela, I will uh, uh, allow others with questions for the other colleagues is there yeah so that they will answer at once yeah. uh, uh, thank you my question my question directed to mr mandinde right my question comes from the background that our constitution has been developed through the copac which was a consensus building process so my understanding of a legal document is just a legal moral, which has to be protected. Is it the question of the moral or is it the question of implementing and interpretation of that moral? Are we having a problem of the legal part or are we having a problem 
in terms of interpreting what has been written down. Thank you. The last one for this round. Yeah, in any Mpunzongu, Wakanangano, Karina, na President Masarira, the Gaba on Napa, Patuita Maswapura, Vastaura, Nemungo, Presidential Candidate, I mean, Koma, Mimi, Demato, again, the Matunga, Wenika, a man who has a change in the Kokak Fita, Wango, Saura, Nanya, the good politics, the Dutri Toks, Shaganyana, the good Tisu Gunagbata, but even instead, you go to Munarutu Jinira, a Atau Nesaki, you are good Nangana and Ume. And this is the victim of number seven. Thank you very much. Uh, I will allow uh, Comrade Masarira to address your questions. Then, Ms. Mandinde will address Okay, to my brother who asked the first question um, one of the tragedies we have had as a people is thinking that we are less important. Everyone matters and every voice matters if we are going to transform Zimbabwe to ensure sustainable human development and sustainable economic growth. The moment we think that there are demigods who are just supposed to do everything for us, we will always find ourselves left behind because we're expecting someone to feel the heat beneath the frying pan when they are not even there where the heat is coming from. Representatives of other sectors that I spoke about should go and sit at that broad-based national dialogue. Vendors have got their own vendor organizations. Plenty of them. We've got VSET by Semu Adzai. I, I think there are plenty of our vendor associations that know the issues that are affecting vendors. We've got a lot of women organizations. We've got a lot of trade unions. We've got a lot of student unions. And every sector should be represented in this national dialogue for it to be able to benefit every sector of the economy and society of Zimbabwe. And like I alluded earlier on, I've realized that there are sectors that are structurally marginalized in this country. And the Bofana Karagetza Gwataurabanava, notice not the Rwadza, is usually the people from rural areas. Ma society avo. Anka Vakana Iwa Mashikiro Acho, they should also have a voice in what is happening in this country. And they are also equally important. But if we get to a stage of thinking that only the people in the urban areas matter, we will be getting it all wrong. The dialogue that I'm speaking about should just not be at national level. It should cascade into the constituencies, into the wards, right down to the grassroots. Point to a consensus building through dialogue. This is what the people of Zimbabwe want. As it stands, we do not have a collective position as Zimbabweans on what we want. What we want is being defined by us, by our different political leaders, which is the wrong footplate of how we are supposed to be solving our problems in this country. Our problems are supposed to start being highlighted, identified by those at the grassroots, so that we find a solution that works for every Zimbabwean, regardless of class in the society. My second response goes to the issue of Pollard. Linda Tsungirirai Masarira has never been part of Pollard. Contrary to the propaganda that I continuously see being written by the media in this country, being said by fellow politicians, activists, and plenty of you in here, Pollard was constituted by people who participated as presidential candidates in 2018. In 2018, I ran for Harare Central MP seat, and thus have no mandate whatsoever to be in Pollard. Most people thought that I'm in Pollard because there was a call for us to go and get vaccinated as a show of courage that vaccination is all right. And when we went to Victoria Falls, everyone started labeling me a Pollard member. I am not a Pollard member. I never got a Pollard vehicle. I do not even get Pollard allowances. I do not sit in Pollard meetings. 
I am tired of saying the same thing over and over again about the propaganda some of you created to tarnish my image to say Linda is part of ZANU PF, she's speaking for that. I've had a lot, but I don't care because as you me see, as you don't let this is orangu and this is where Kupola Dini. Munodi took it up a sina, Muchitang with a passina, Muchi Pipira passina, and in Antinanda name me. Now put in those Muka Funga, and I cannot answer on behalf of Pollard. Do you end up with your abductions? Never training. Vow Stalos is the Varipana. I'm not going to keep town in Zambia. Watch a pindura. Va all better, Masaro, Varipano. Ah! I am not using anyone's name in vain because every time I am asked by people, wait, Mirai. Mirai, let me finish this. In any angle, they want to get emotional or what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it. My trainings, Aka Itwa, Tagamasuka State Jivan, Gabuni, say my passport, Avo, Dotaura, and my Mansi Acho, Ati Dimunaramba, Mutaura, or Linda, Anonyepa. Linda says this. Tava, I pop up on your map, Dutch, and Dimunam Jifuza, Mufuzo, which did took her, but I don't tell about someone because of Tidomania and such. In any that can see any end, the guy Pera, the Gatia Pera Kudara. But him Kadakuram Bamchi Muta and Jasogoti, Ningina, Ningi Gabuni, say my passport, a Mandia cat, Ningina, Ningi Topet, and I had Mona to Linda, and I'm over. Nema, Dapeds and Doenda Kunyaya, Yakun Dance and Doita don't play my abduction. Doita don't play Shakat. Every time there's an international sitting, opposition, the domain opposition has got a habit of creating artificial conflict. Could I justify your two nominicas? No, don't be a mush. Toyenda, that obeys, ha? Whether Mugatza, Mugadi, that has to stop. Oda, 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 oda. So, oda, oda. Oda, 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 oda. Order, 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 comrades, order, order, comrades. You see, you you get order, 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 comrades. Hey, order, order, my friend, order, 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 order. Ah, uh -uh, order. What you are doing is not necessary. Order. No, 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 my friend. Order, order, order. My friend, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, order, 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 order. This is not the kind of conversation we want. The colleagues are here, they will respond, hey, order, order. She has a right to say what she, order, order. Madame Masarira has the right to say her views and will give others to say views to the contrary or in support of her. You don't have to do what you are doing. So what you are now going to do, before I call the director of the of you Zimbabwe, hey, my friend, no more questions. Hey, order. Hey, order. Order, 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 order. You are Shamari. You are Shamari. You don't come here with us. I am not going to be here. I am not going to be here. I am not going to be here. I am Order, order, 
uh, order, order. My, my, hey, order. Keep, hey. Ah, uh, sit down. Keep quiet. Keep quiet, man. Hey, anyway. Ah, uh, uh, sit down. Ah, uh, sit down. Hey. Ah, uh, get away. You guys, this is not. Listen. Listen. Hey, listen. Guys, this is not a rally. So, this is not a rally. You have no right to harass anybody. It is up to me to put this house in order. And you cannot threaten anyone. You cannot threaten a journalist. You cannot threaten any citizen. You cannot threaten any person. This is not the purpose of this meeting. The purpose of this meeting is peaceful coexistence. Yeah, if they, hey, my friend, this is not a rally. And uh, this guy, hey. Keep quiet. My friend, keep quiet. It's wrong, Shaur Gita. Hello, hello, hello. 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 Aiwa. Hello. Excuse me. Hello, my friend, my friend, my friend, you are not the convener of this meeting. We have heard your point. What is your purpose? Don't disrupt the people's meeting. It, excuse me, comrades. Comrades, you have come to this meeting. If you are people of dignity, you must respect the conveners of this meeting for bringing you together. No, 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 no. We don't want disruptive. And you don't want disruptive. If, if there are issues, I will be able to address this guy. But anyone who comes to this meeting must leave this meeting peacefully without being threatened by anyone. No, 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 my friend. You are out of order. So what we are going to do now is to allow our comrades that are in front there to make last... Um, some are of the apples, then we allow the director of you Zimbabwe to give a vote of things. So what we are going to do is to allow the comrades in front to give a summary of uh, our proceedings. But you know, I'm Zimbabwe. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. I'm going to say that. We at the level of ideas. We must attack each other at the level of points. Not to go to the other one. All right. So I'm now going to give you uh, the last round, just 30 minutes. Obed, you have to say what you wanted without necessarily being, you know. I know you can do much better. So I will start with Mr. Mandinde. Then we give a round, then we allow the director of the department to Did you say 30 minutes so that I it can start now? Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, oh, as I wind up, I will possibly also take an opportunity to respond uh, to the one question that had been asked to me. But the issue really goes to the raw scope of the constitution that we got as Zimbabwe and how it is being interpreted. I think from the constitutional courts and from our courts, we have received very good judgments. I think there are judgments to do with the aspect of the uh, child, banning child marriages. We have had uh, the constitutional courts declaring issues to do with corporal punishment. Uh, we also have the constitutional court dealing with a few other issues. But we must also say we have also had the constitutional court apply what I opted to call the doctrine of avoidance. Where the constitutional court has uh, deliberately uh, uh, not come up with decisions as and when they are due. Uh, we saw that happening especially uh, during the just ended election, I think the Sevier Kasukwere matter is an example where the doctrine of avoidance was applied, where the courts will not come up with a proper decision. 
uh, but we will come or dwell on technicalities so as not to uh, reel on the merits of a matter. So those are some of the issues. Some of my colleagues and the, pol and the uh, political parties uh, in particular have opted to use the term that there is what we call judicial capture. As legal practitioners ourselves, we are afraid of using that particular term because we continue appearing before the courts. Uh, so we do not want to be taken to task to then have to answer for such questions, for, for such uh, issues. But that's basically what other people choose to tell it. Therefore, but as we wind up in, the, in terms of my parting shots uh, today, I just re-emphasize the fact that at the moment uh, we spoke about the lack of peace, we need peace in this country. At the moment, we need to find each other as Zimbabweans. And at the moment, uh, the issue of dialogue is necessary and it's something that is not going to happen uh, without us as Zimbabweans. We need to be included, all of us as Zimbabweans, uh, from wherever, uh, Marambafungwe, Uzumba, Gokwe, Binga, Choloche, Lopani, Kimani Mani, Mondoro, ETC, everyone has to be represented on the table. Thank you. I think those will be my parting shots. Thank you, Ms. Mandindi. Kune Ime doctrine, Musan Shored, you know the doctrine of effectiveness in constitutional law. Doctrine of effectiveness, Yagavano with Indigas Gapampa, Koewe, Nigato Ndinda to Baba Pano, Vanae Papa Gatoti, Evachonti Baba, Nito play a royal Baba, Nito Dinda to Baba Papa. You know the doctrine of effectiveness. Ndika wia kwa kana zeshe ni ya kwa kana muri SRC chen muri ba students. Don't need that to present we SRC. Ba students don't present ruwa nya. Ndi wa toli ja wedu wa jito dini ni jito pita shete. Ni jito di, you know the doctrine of effectiveness. You know anza kituwa newa neta ma military coup haya. Muna kata military coup. Even it is what a military coup is unconstitutional. As we are nga ita kuu ya wanu wakatu tanga ndi wa to present. Da jito ni muta keda. Jito ichi ya makapine. Ndi wa atu wachi. You know the doctrine of effectiveness. Um, okay, my part in short, um, we have to maintain peace always. I'm one person who does not subscribe to the doctrine of despondency and anarchy. We saw great nations fall, like Libya, because of despondency and anarchy. We need to save Zimbabwe from doom. No Zimbabwean deserves to die for a politician. What we need to do is to ensure that we get every Zimbabwean to be peaceful as we try to find means to transition, to change the government. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let, let me obviously register my displeasure against, you know, I'm a spokesperson of uh, the alternative government, and part of my uh, responsibility is to protect members of the media. Uh, so at times when they see us, they exercise their freedom to, uh, you know, it's slaughter because we protect them. And uh, it's an unnegotiable position uh, for some of us because the media must be protected. But uh, let me, I see that people who have tempers, but you know, uh, you have just had hallucinations and delusions of grandeur. And, and such delusions of grandeur uh, are not a new phenomena in the Zimbabwean body politic. People travel across the world, people do whatever they do, they've got the freedom. But you know the danger, and let me say this for posterity, so that the history records is very clear. And for revolutionaries here, when you soul sell your soul to the devil, the immediate thing that departs is common sense. <laughs> that is the immediate thing that departs. So, so trinkets and trappings of dictatorship have done that. And history is awash. I'm a student of history. Why I'm not shocked about such is because I read upon my history. I understand that history has a tendency of repeating itself. You know that comrades were killed during the liberation struggle because of a person called Albert Nyat. You know that people sell a revolution for trinkets and trappings of fascism and dictatorship. 
And people, the unfortunate thing is that people die, people get arrested on the basis of uh, fabricated um, hallucinations. But for some of us now, and let the history know it, when we joined the democratic opposition politics, we were conscious that this struggle will require us to be ideologically astute so that we don't sell the revolution, so that we don't abandon the ordinary people, so that we suffer the consequences. You know, this is not the first time because you know that a few weeks ago I was charged with inciting violence because of wearing a Highlander's T-shirt. There is always going to be a victimization. But when they give us as blows, to us it is water to the revolution. And when we die, we know that we didn't abandon the revolution. We left a mark in the annals of history that the people must be free. That's why we are not scared. That's why we are not petrified. Jail is part of the revolution. Jail is part of the struggle. And there are always going to be those that aid jailing of genuine Democrats, genuine revolutionaries. You know that uh, Prof. Ruana, in our yesterday movement, as I conclude, some of our legitimate members of parliament were elected by people, were recalled by some who went to the bed with the regime. But look, detectorship will always have that. They will take you, they will use you, you abort and abandon the struggle. And just like that other thing that people use during their private time, you'll be used and be damned. That is the nature of fascist, so we are not, uh, uh, you know, worried. We are focused on the genuine, and the genuine concentration for some of us is that our people must be free, that our people, as long as our people still live a life worse than the dogs of the rich, we are going to fight dictatorship. Whatever applause come, whatever fabrication come, whether they charge us with rape, whether they charge us with insurgency, whether they charge us with treason. Mandela stayed in prison. Revolutionaries like Tongo Gara, Nikita Mangena, they stayed in prison for this freedom that we are talking about. So these are part and parcel of the bruises that oil our national democratic revolution and we are not far black as state. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. I think maybe my parting shots, uh, I think there is an issue where comrades are saying, how then do we get everyone to be dialoguing? I think it is important for us to understand the stages of dialogue, that we have a stage for consultation. Then some people will get a mandate, they will get legitimacy to go to the stage of conferencing. So we are not going to say people come to Zumba and conference in Harare to discuss what's the way forward, but there should be a legitimate process of genuine consultation. And then some people are going to get legitimacy from their different sectors. Then they will bring the issues from their sectors to the conferencing table, representing at least a particular community. But obviously when I respond to some issues, if they were not issues but they were insults. We should never confuse insults and issues. When we come here, we're all taught to be civilized, and I understand that some people are trapped, they are prisoners because they chose to so sell out their souls, they are prisoners, and they will try at every point in time to say things that they're expected to say. Uh, just for the record, let me make it very clear. I know that people are conferencing right now, some in Europe, some elsewhere, and other comrades who are on this panel, even those who claim that they don't want to be part of meetings. A meeting is not a training. You attend a meeting, that's all. But it's so dangerous for, for us to allow some individuals to come and say you were trained. Because when some state agents in this room know that I was trained, I become an enemy and they can do anything to me. So I was trying to correct that anomaly. But I understand the, these prisoners, uh, they are captured, they are trying to parrot what they are expected to be parroting now, now and again. Uh, but, but now, but now when, you, when you try then, when you, when you engage in political allotry, you and then you try to copy and paste your formula to everyone. It's not everyone who is engaged in fake news and lies. Like the way we used to donate to one of our comrades on this panel, when she would pretend that she has been involved in one issue, one calamity or the other, but we knew she was heading to a bar to drink her next beer. But we used to donate religiously. Now she assumes that this is the same formula and template used by everyone. Some of us, we are here genuinely, we believe that Zimbabwe can be transformed for the benefit of everyone. Yeah. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, yeah, apart from the fact that uh, when we are having this kind of uh, discussions, we want to interact at the level of ideas. So, uh, 
it is very important that we, we, we don't take things personal. Zimbabwe is, is for everyone. We must deal with issues. And we must desist from taking personal barbs against each other. Uh, usually, if I'm uh, moderating, I, I remove my other ears that you all know and try to be straightforward and try to be 